Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. So, with well, if you ask, yeah, yeah, how did I stick this out? Yeah. Which, I guess, because it didn't feel like I was sticking it out. It felt like any other thing that you do. There are times where you just, you know, you, things are going really smoothly and everything's great. And then there are other times where you're, you know, you're trying to figure out what to do next. I mean, a good example would be like, you know, the crash of 2008. I mean, here you are, we just reeled off um, some of our best years ever in terms of business. I think we had some really fabulous wines and particularly the 2005s are still some of my favorite wines we ever made for Pats and Hall. Um, but you're going into an economy that just isn't going to absorb that much wine and a change a sea change in how they were going to be sold for the next few years in particular because restaurants were just dying in major cities around the country people just didn't want to go out they just didn't know what the future was going to be and they wanted to be home so we had to make some tough choices in 2008 and 2009 about how we were going to you know trim our sales for those um and I, by, by that mean a, like a nautical term as opposed to trim our, our selling ability. Uh, but we wanted to restructure exactly what we were going to offer to the market because we didn't want to have to drop prices radically with a, enormous inventories behind it. So and th not that we were having enormous inventories, but they would, be, they would have been too big for the market at that moment. So we sold some wine in bulk and moved on with the next vintage. And I think it was, you know, from a from a uh, bean counter point of view, that was the right thing to do. But of course, as soon as we, uh, as soon as we would have gotten around to those wines to sell them, the market had changed again, and we might well have been able to do it. I don't know, but regardless, at the moment, it was the right, it was the right move, and I think um, that that was. So a lot of these choices that you make are more like business choices than they are. I mean, we knew what we wanted to do in terms of the artistic part of it. The the technical part of winemaking was never in question. There was never a moment where somebody said, gee, I wish we could, you know, we should do this for less money. We should, we should buy cheaper grapes or we should, you know, not use barrels or we should, whatever. Nobody ever said that at Patson Hall. We were only interested in, in, the, the, in creating wines that we were all super proud of. And in fact, you know, it would be reflected in things like, you know, working late during harvest. I mean, you, know, you could say, ah, you know, we'll just wait and do that tomorrow kind of thing. But I, that drove me crazy because I, I had a feeling that if we did that, if we just let it go or, you know, skip this step today because we're all tired and want to go home, um, that I'd be someplace next year or the year after and the wine would be less good than it was the year before. And people would say, why isn't it as good? Was it a hard vintage? And you, you know, you'd be thinking back on, why did I go home early? Now I've got to pay the price every time I go someplace. So there was a great commitment amongst all of the partners to just make sure that we did everything we could possibly think of to make the best wines. And that certainly carried over into all my new stuff as well. How engaged were you in the winemaking process? And so, obviously. you know, at the very beginning, we all did it. I mean, we were all there together. But the last, I mean, that was probably until, I don't know, the late 90s. So for, for roughly, you know, almost probably eight or ten vintages, we were all there. We all did stuff together. We all, James was taking the lead of it, of course. James Hall was the taking the lead of it, of course. But we were all involved. And then it really evolved into a thing where, none of us had time to do everything and so we really focused on doing different parts and so james really became not that he ever wasn't but he really took over singularly the winemaking and then um and moses really took over california i did everything outside of california in terms of sales and marketing and and um, and heather really did most of the back of the house stuff at that point if you were to go back in time and give yourself advice in those early middle business days, what would it sound like? <laughs> I don't know. What would I t for business advice? Uh, I don't know that. I mean, I kind of felt like we made whether it was sheer luck or we actually were able to see clearly what was going on. I think we did a really good job of following along with what our customers really wanted. So 
it's easy to sort of just say, oh, you should only do what you believe in your own little heart, right? And to, I would say about 99% that's true, but um, you know, if there's a point where you can still feel really good about the wine, be proud of it, and know that the wine is going to be more readily accepted in the market, you should probably think about doing that because there are two parts to this business. A lot of times people get all caught up in the in the glamour side of it, which is, you know, vineyards and the beauty of the place. And um, if you're not actually winemaking yourself, the idea of winemaking is, it sounds so romantic and stuff, but it's, it's ultimately, this is a business. And in order, unless you're a, a billionaire, you just don't care. And I've never met a billionaire that didn't care. Um, you want to, you want it to function as a real business. And, and, and I think that that's, that's one of the things we rarely talk about in the wine industry is that there is a business element to this too and the wines have to be acceptable. I think we should. <clears throat> that is a discussion I'm hoping to have continuously and I'm very glad that you said what you just said because you're absolutely right. Um, there's that notion of romance and something very nebulous and special and alluring and the hard business reality that you were acutely aware of early on is what truly drives it internally and i think it was a tremendous foundational part to what you eventually achieved so for us and, and this actually came up in discussions internally but for us we were we watched other people around us who had you know a significant amount of money backing them up whether it was their family or something that they'd done themselves came from another industry with you know a bunch of money to be able but we were flying without a net so if we stumbled at Pats and Hall at the especially in the first 10 years or so if we stumbled we were out of business there was you know there was no margin for error and you you feel that acutely when you when you know that to be true uh, so leaving no stone unturned was really I think an important part starting off with great grapes getting people that know what they're doing in the vineyards to work with you is really cri critical to our success as well, I think. I think for those of you that are listening that either own business or obviously work for a business, it is such a seminal piece. The fact that attention to detail, you know, the proverbial devil in the details was extraordinarily important. That's, you stayed up nights, as you described, trying to make sure that you did everything you could, everything in your power to make it happen. That you divided the duties even though we've established James Hall as a winemaker of record but the truth is that the few years you know prior to that becoming official in every sense you were so hands-on and so involved and that was a passion of yours you just <clears throat> practiced the necessities because somebody had to do it and do it right well I we had this conversation early on with Pat's and Hall I said I told James I said you know I'm not really interested in just a new project that I get to sell. I'm already doing lots of selling. I already know how to do that. It's not very interesting to me to have some new project because I can't think of anything else to sell. I'm really only interested if you know, we're going to all be involved with every part of the business and um, get a chance to experience. And I think you, as James, as the winemaker, ought to experience what it's like to be out there in front of customers and have them ask you questions you're a little uncomfortable with because I think it puts things into perspective so I want to walk vineyards I want to you know fill barrels I want to do the same kinds of stuff to make sure that I have that authority and authentic feel when I go talk to people about it as well but that's part of the fun of it too I mean you don't you start one of these little projects to get rich you start it because you really want to try doing some things a little differently and see if people like it as much as what you think you're going to like it for. And that's, you know, that's been the sort of driving force. I, I really didn't, and I, I didn't get super rich doing this, but I really wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it because I liked sharing wine with people. I liked the feeling of being able to walk around in a vineyard and get a sense of what that place is like and how that impacted the wine that we were making. So, that's why I did it. <clears throat> I would propose that the root of your success is in putting consumer first, the end user first. Well, that's, yes, I think so. Um, 
I think I think there's a balance point here. If you become so obsessed with the consumer, you end up making wines, and I'm not going to name brands, but a lot there's an awful lot of California wines that are overtly sweet at this point because that seems like what the consumer wants. So if you put the consumer first, then that's what you're going to end up with. Um, we I wanted to make wines that were attractive, but were maybe a little more sophisticated, and we needed people who understood wine as opposed to simply wanted a beverage that was hip and cool to drink. So yeah, our wines were dry. I mean, they were completely dry because they were bottled without filtering them. And if you bottle a sweet wine without filtering it, you're going to end up getting re-fermentation in the bottle, which is never pretty. By putting consumer first, what I meant was not so much the palatal preferences, which, you know, are subject to interpretation and depends who you listen to, right? Um, a lot of people claim to understand, to have a hands on the pulse of the consumer preferences, and I sometimes find myself questioning heavily um, their conclusions. Uh, I think what, what's really interesting to me is the fact that you've brought up several times in our discussion that you wanted to express to people what it's like to really be in the vineyard and bonding with the vines and <laughs> experiencing it. You wanted that transference, you wanted to be that translator, if you will, for lack of a better term, for somebody who doesn't have the opportunity to do that. And the other piece that stood out is that it's value added inherently when you're trying to make the best wine you can. Not necessarily what you think is going to please them, but being so close to it on a daily basis, creating something that is important and that is something that's the best that you can make in that moment of time with those resources. And that, to me, is what honors the consumer's palate. So I'd agree with that. Um, as I was doing this, the only person I knew well was me. So I made wines that the, were the ones that sounded interesting to me and that I could then tell the story to other people and explain why I found them interesting and, and perhaps why they might find them interesting as well. So. When I would write a newsletter, I would write, I would think to myself, the very first thing I would think is, okay, so what's happening right now that if I were still, you know, sitting in Minneapolis, I would want to know about. Very good. Because I can't be in California to see it, but tell me what's going on in the vineyard right now. And, and, um, and I had a lot of fun doing those. Um, eventually, I, you know, Things change over time. I just waved my hands, <laughs> and so you know, the, I think our our uh, our mailing stuff changed over time as well, and probably wasn't quite as descriptive. But but that's that's where I started from. Is what was interesting to me, and I'm pretty sure if I'm interested in it, and I'll be excited enough to tell other people about it, and probably they'll find it interesting too. If they hadn't, we'd have been out of business. So. Well, this is actually a testament to your very effective storytelling. <laughs> um, um, this days, and, and I mean authentic, another word that gets used a lot, I should say abused. Um, you know, these days, everybody professes to be a storyteller because all of a sudden, in the current iteration of the wine business, that's what's required. Um, however, there's a big difference between you actually having your hands in it and being thoughtful about it. It's the quality of the storytelling that really speaks to um, what separates good from, you know, some degree of mediocrity. And it's that storytelling that brought about Pats and Hall rise. And I want to specifically focus on the Pinot part of it. I know you started with Chardonnay, but um, you've referenced a couple of brands. Um, one of them was Kistler, which really was the major player once upon a time, pre-sideways, pre-Pinot explosion. And it was a reference point for many people that love Pinot. And then there's a few others, but Kistler certainly leaps to mind because early on they received a lot of critical acclaim and such like that. Um, but there was relatively few people in the marketplace that were compatible qualitatively to Kistler. There was just a handful. And you started building your Pinot brand, I feel like, very deliberately because your fruit sources spoke to that. What, what was what was the beginning of it? In addition to making um, what you described as 
as marketing decision that there was a hole in the marketplace that you could have, you could be making cab and be one off, but you wanted to pursue Pinot, but you not only pursued it, you pursued it from Don Pat's and James Hole point of view. Tell us about that. Well, the big challenge for us was to find a great a grape source that we were happy with, and. Uh, I mean, we would have probably started doing Pinot Noir, you know, three or four years earlier. It's just we weren't coming up with grapes that we liked. And we all had real jobs at this point, too. And it wasn't until 1995 that I started doing Pats and Hall full time. Mm -hmm. um, and then probably three or four years later, maybe, um, everyone else finally flipped over and was doing Pats and Hall full time as well. So... It had to be, you know, it had to fit in amongst other things that we had to do. And we were equally engaged with um, our other jobs and had, had to be. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have them anymore. So finding the grape sources was, was a real challenge. We were able to find a source of Pinot Noir uh, in 1995 uh, right along the uh, Russian River on West Side Road, we don't buy the grapes anymore, hadn't for a long time, but but Patson Hall, James Hall, I'm pretty sure is the one who came up with these grapes. And, uh, and that sort of got our foot in the door. Once we were able to make Russian River Pinot on the label, then um, we were able to uh, start moving around and talking to other people in the, in the, in the area. It's funny because, you know, like 1995, so early 1996, I started um, calling vineyards that we were interested in working with. And there's this uh, thing, I'm not sure if it's still available or not, but the, at the time there was a publication that the um, Sonoma Grape Growers did called The Purple Book. And it listed all of their members, phone numbers, what they grew, as long as they gave the information, you know, there was a phone number, there was a fax number sometimes. This is pre-email. So um, it was interesting. So that summer of 96 or spring and summer, I was calling all of these guys up and asking if they had fruit because wa we wanted to expand the, the Pinot program that we'd started in 95. And we weren't really getting very far um, because this is what I would run into. I'd get the guy on the phone and I'd say, you know, do you have, um, do you have any Chardonnay and or especially Pinot Noir available? And the response would be, where are you? And I'd say, well, we're currently making our wines um, in Rutherford at Honig Cellars because, you know, a winemaker is the winemaker for Honig as well. But we're focused on doing, um, in particular, we want to do Russian River Pinot Noir. Their response was, "We only sell wines to, we only sell wines to Sonoma County wineries," and I would hear that over and over again. Uh, but because we finally found one source of Pinot that we were able to buy some grapes from, we were allowed then to be a sort of an auxiliary member of the Russian River uh, Grape Growers Association, and then. We went to a couple of their social events and suddenly now we're meeting all the growers, right? They're all there having a picnic or something. And we're walking around and talking with a couple of our friends that we see there. And the next thing you know, they're introducing us to new people. They're saying, hey, by the way, do you know Tom over here who, who grows grapes? And uh, maybe he's got some for you. Here, Tom, here's Donald and, and James um, from Pats and Hall. And uh, it, that, was the key, that was the key turning point for Pino is we went from sort of outsiders who live over in Napa on the wrong side of the valley for, for grapes from Sonoma. And then suddenly we became kind of almost insiders, even though for a long time after that, we were still all holed up in Napa. And I think we really felt like um, we wanted to follow the newest plantings. And the reason was because there were so many new clones becoming available. So we wanted to be able to get especially the Dijon clone Pinot um, early on because we felt that there was a quality gap between a lot of the stuff that had been planted in the past, which is really an, another economic thing. I mean, they had to grow enough tons per acre in order to make it worthwhile because nobody was paying them anything for Pinot until probably a little bit before Sideways, but Sideways certainly drove it. So we 
we, we spent a lot of time looking for grapes. In fact, for several years, I had all of my marketing stuff geared towards growers. I knew I was going to be able to sell the wine. We weren't making all that much of it. A couple thousand cases of wine a year wasn't that hard to sell. At that moment in time, there was a lot of demand for California wines across the board, not as many brands. So I'll, we'd release the wine, it would go out fairly smoothly. But I was having trouble finding additional grape sources. And I, all James I know was looking, I was looking, we were rattling cages trying to find fruit. And slowly but surely, we uh, found our way into, I think, some of the best sites in California, you know, from Mendocino at Alder Springs Vineyard, all the way down to Pizzoni Vineyard in the Santa Lucia Highlands, and primarily in Sonoma, but also Carneros part of Napa for Pinot. Um, and the style of winemaking is a little different too. I mean, and I think I've said this before at places, I think the biggest challenge, one of the biggest cha challenges for making Pinot Noir in California early on was well, a lot of times the grapes weren't being grown in the right spot. But even if you found the grapes in the right spot, the biggest challenge was winemakers had already had success with Cabernet. The reason that's a problem is because you cannot make Pinot Noir like Cabernet and be successful. It just doesn't taste right. It doesn't taste like Pinot Noir. It's not very attractive. It just tastes like sort of an average red wine. And so you have to apply a different set of techniques Success with Cabernet told the winemakers from the, in the 70s and early 80s that they are geniuses at making wine. And so whatever they were doing with Cabernet should immediately make genius Pinot Noir. And it took, I think, a long time. I'm pretty sure there were people that knew this at the beginning. And like, it's not something that I was the only one who figured out, or James Hall and I, or, or you know, a handful of people. I think a lot of people kind of understood that there was a problem. We weren't making fabulous Pinot. There's no reason why we shouldn't be. The climates and soils should be uh, as good for Pinot Noir as it is for any other grape. So what's the problem? And I think finally we started to get a grip on it. And I think that it's going to continue to improve too. It's not like we've found the Holy Grail yet, but I, I think the big problem was techniques. We weren't using any whole cluster. We weren't, um, we weren't doing pre-soaks or post-fermentation stuff that, uh, uh, excuse me, extended macerations. Um, and there were differences in temperatures as well. And so there's all kinds of stuff that you can do that, that, that is not necessarily strictly a manipulation thing, but simple, fairly straightforward things that are different from Cabernet uh, to, to Pinot Noir that can make a more interesting wine. And when as a group, all of the people that were fascinated with Pinot Noir began to move that direction. I think things really started to happen for Pinot. But the biggest change was planting new places and then learning how to make it. It certainly became quite a vibrant scene and you made some um, really interesting comments about cellar work. I just want to highlight the vineyard part of it. You're describing early on farmers that farmed for yields, and that's what they're used to. Well, had to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they weren't being paid that yeah, much, absolutely. right? And so, and this is true for every variety. I mean, right. we we saw one guy, a really nice guy that we never bought grapes from because we're walking along his vineyard, and he's saying, "Yes, I can consistently get ten tons per acre ripe here." And I thought, "Yeah, but what do they taste like?" I mean, ten. James Hall and I were looking at each other in the vineyard and thinking, "How fast can we get out of here?" Because this isn't going to work for what we want to do. How influential were you in turning the farmers' heads around and maybe incentivizing them down the line in growing wine as opposed to grapes? Well, that's a, an interesting question. Probably you'd have to ask the growers themselves how much they paid attention to us. I, I think there were a bunch, of, a, a bunch of factors that were all coming together that probably pressed them, um, especially Pinot Noir growers, to lower yields and um, you know and more focus on quality versus quantity um, in order to be able to get there they had to be able to get more money per ton and so yeah. somebody had to be willing to start there I think we were probably eager to spend more money on grapes than maybe some of the some of our other friends because you know we were trying to break into a club that was tough to get into uh, and so price was going to make a, a difference to that I, 
you have to drive all the way over to Napa with your fruit, then just an ironic statement because it's not that far. But, you know, if, for them, it was like, wow, do I really have to go to that other valley? Then it's got to be, you have to make it worthwhile. And, you know, we came up with some ideas, but it, I don't think we were, I don't think we were unique in this. You know, I think it, it's really important to keep in mind that as somebody who's been, who's walked through it, that it wasn't just us. There were other people. We couldn't have done it. Pats and Hall could not have done this all by itself. There had to be a whole bunch of people all rowing in the same direction about Pinot Noir, or we would have just been, you know, this little voice in the wilderness. Um, even if the wines had been great, we didn't make enough to, to turn the market. It was a lot of people being interested in wine and making wine and working hard at it as well. But our, our plan was... Um, to continue to try to find good grapes and we encourage people to plant multiple clones primarily Dijon clones but later on you know other stuff as well so it's clearly momentum in your a part of it yeah a bit of a competitive advantage because you started pretty early before the scene got well and we had Chardonnay too so yeah. it wasn't like we were just starting doing Pinot Noir yeah. um, and that was the beginning and then you had to figure out how to sell it we had people interested in what we were doing and Chardonnay and Pinot make sense if you're, you know, sort of a wine lover, you know that that's true in Burgundy, that both grapes are grown there, that they both that both grapes make great wine. So I think it was logical that we had started off focusing on Chardonnay, that Pinot would be the next the next part of the program for us. Well, by any measure, how would painstakingly you have collected quite um, a bevy of fruit sources that was um, significant. Every single single vineyard bottling that you've made was from a vineyard that was either notable, up and coming. There was there was a lot of um, rhyme and reason why you pursued those fruit sources. We well, we certainly got grapes from a, a number of sites that never made single vineyard designate wines either. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think it was really important to have a program that was set up so that we had a place for grapes to go if they weren't going to make the quality we were looking for for single vineyard designates. But it were good. So the wine can be good and fit into a blend and be a really happy member of that blend. So the, the originally it was Russian River and then it became Sonoma Coast. Pinot blend was, was kind of critical to being able to make the number of different single vineyard wines, even though, you know, we were far afield. There was no place for extra Pizzoni to go, for example, because that's San Lucia Highlands. It doesn't fit into Russian River. The same thing with um, Alder Springs. But the other stuff that we were doing, particularly from Sonoma, all sort of blend, had the potential for becoming part of the blend if it, if it didn't stand up to the quality we were looking for. And I have to say, though, a number of the vineyards that we started off with, nobody knew at the time, but have become famous afterwards. So... Uh, I think that we certainly had something to do with, with that. Again, it wasn't just us, but there were other people working it the same way. Uh, but I think that uh, they became famous because they were growing great grapes and had a number of people making really fabulous wines from them. Well, there's certainly uh, an argument that could be made about the branding that you brought to the table. Well, there's a you know, famous grape grower in the Napa Valley, Andy Beckstoffer, whose plan is to base the price of his grapes off from what you're going to sell a bottle of wine for on a retail basis. It's a little bit more complicated now and Andy is a highly respected guy in the wine industry and um, and, and grows some fabulous fruit but uh, we had a conversation. I specifically sat across the table from Andy um, one afternoon at my house in St. Helena and he came over and wanted to talk to me about possibly continuing. We bought some grapes one year from him continuing to buy grapes and he was insistent that um, he wanted to know what the retail price of the wine was going to be so he could base his pricing on the grapes off that. And I said, so let me get this straight, <laughs> Andy. You have two blocks side by side. Essentially, you're going to farm them exactly the same. You've already told me that you know that you guys are grape growers and, and the impact uh, that we might be able to make in suggestions on the vineyards isn't going to really isn't going to work for you. So you're going to grow these grapes exactly the same way. One guy is going to put it into a $18 bottle of Chardonnay and you're going to charge him $1,800 per ton. Ours is going into a $30 bottle. So we have to pay $3,000 a ton for exactly the same fruit. 
The conclusion of this interview can be found in the next podcast, already available for your download. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Pal Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson.